It's early June. We've had an amazing couple of months here at the Cash Management Group. Tons of clients who've been uh, looking for a place to, uh, to invest their short-term cash. And in times of crisis, this is an unusual where you see a lot of companies starting to hoard cash, individuals, high net worth individuals hoarding cash because of the uncertainty the future holds. One of the things that we've noticed is the Bank of Canada, look, the Bank of Canada stopped cutting interest rates at the end of March. That was the last time they cut interest rates. They brought their overnight lending rate down to a, a, an all-time low, a quarter percent. We're getting near zero and possibly in a negative territory, as we've now started to see happening in the short-term treasury market in the United States. But over the last two months, what we've noticed is the commercial banks and credit unions continue to cut their rates. Yet the Bank of Canada hasn't cut interest rates for two months. So we were trying to figure out why is this the case? You know, a lot of the banks and credit unions we talk with on a daily basis have told us that they're flush with liquidity. We know some of the names we've spoken with are up three and four fold over what they normally maintain in short term liquidity. Now, the reasons that have been given to us are twofold. One is they're having a hard time lending these funds out. And number two, they've been concerned about a run on their deposits at some point. So they wanted to prop up their balance sheets, so to speak, to make sure that there was enough of a buffer there in case there started to be a drawdown on their balance sheets. So we decided that, you know what, let's instead of trying to take anecdotal information, let's go right into the data itself. So there's an organization called OSFI. It's the Office of the Superintendent for Financial Institutions. This is the federal regulator that regulates all the banks across Canada, the big six banks that everybody knows of, the medium and regional sized banks, small banks, and federal credit unions. So we decided to dive into their actual website because in there, deep inside their website, you can find the balance sheets of every single bank in Canada. Now banks in Canada are obligated to provide their balance sheet data every single month. Now the data unfortunately is delayed. So we are now here in early June and the data that's available on the website up to this point is the end of March. So as we start to give you these numbers, just keep this in mind. The information we're attaining here is from December 31st, 2019 to March 31st, 2020, so the first three months of 2020. Keep in mind that the, the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic didn't really hit the markets in the North American uh, uh, health systems until about mid-March. So we know that these numbers, whatever we're gonna talk about here, you're gonna know these numbers are probably even worse or bigger uh, as we go on. So we'll be looking forward to seeing reporting on the April numbers and the May numbers as they come out. So one of the things we looked at is what is the cash balances looking like for these banks right now? And here's the, here's the astonishing figures. We started off with looking at the two behemoth banks being TD and Royal Bank. In the three months from December 31st, 2019 to March 31st, 2020, TD and Royal collectively increased their cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet by $100 billion. It's a 78% increase. We decided to analyze this a little further and expand that list to the big five banks. We've got TD, Royal, Bank of Nova Scotia, Bank of Montreal, and CIBC. And that number was 131 billion. So you can see the, the lion's share of that increase happened with the two big uh, banks, being TD and Royal, but still a 46% increase in a three month period. Then we expanded that list a little further and looked at all the banks in Canada. And that number is 143 billion. So it's quite interesting to see that out of the every all the banks in Canada, there was 143 billion dollars in increased cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet in the first three months, of which 100 of that 143 billion happened with just the two biggest banks. You want to talk about an oligopoly? There it is. That increase was 45 percent. Now, for those of you who don't follow this bank data, just to give you a context. In the entire year of 2019, from January 1st till December 31st, the, all of the banks in Canada together collectively increased their cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet by $5 billion, a 2% increase. So it took an entire 12 months for their cash balances to go up by $5 billion, and then three months for their cash balances to go up by $143 billion. Now, let me segue that into what I describe as what's up, what's down, and what hasn't moved. I'm gonna tie this all in and take it back to what's happening to the banks right now. So what's up, what's down, what hasn't changed? First of all, the stock market, way up. Since the market low of March 23rd, we've seen the Dow Jones go from around 18,000 points back to 26, off of its high of 30 from the beginning of the year. 
The last time before the global pandemic, uh, COVID-19 global pandemic happened, the last time we saw the Dow Jones at 26,000 points was in January of 2018. I would ask yourself, does it make sense that the equity markets have the same valuation today that they did in January of 2018? I mean, think back to January 2018. First of all, absolutely no, no ex expectations of a global pandemic coming down the pipeline. Unemployment rates were basically at 52 year lows. The economy was charging forward on all fronts and there wasn't even really a lot of talk about uh, trade wars between the United States and China. I mean, everything was firing all cylinders. Fast forward to today, same stock market valuation and we've got a major global pandemic and all sorts of other nasty things going on that I'm about to talk to you about. So what else is up? Well, as we saw, the cash balances with these banks are up, but we're also seeing all time record unemployment in the last century. I mean, the last time we saw this kind of record unemployment was back during the Great Depression. We are currently in Canada at an unemployment rate of 13%, but keep in mind that data is over a month old. It's much higher in the United States, of course, because their data gets published every week. We got to see our Canadian government get this figured out because monthly data in this kind of environment is far too slow. What else is up? Fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus. Fiscal stimulus is, of course, the activity that the, gov the federal government is uh, implementing to be able to help prop up the economy. And, and monetary stimulus is what the Bank of Canada is doing. Of course, they've cut interest rates down to basically zero. So what's down? Here's the first one that's shocking, insolvencies. We started insolvency tracker here recently because there's been some really big headline names, but if you look at across the, net, across the entire nation, both in Canada and the United States, at personal and corporate insolvencies, they're down. Latest data today on saw on the ticker is 38% drop in insolvencies month over month. A 38% drop in this kind of environment doesn't make sense to me. What else is down? Interest rates are going down, we've talked about that and housing sales have gone way down. The one thing that hasn't changed, so what's, what's the same, is mortgage pricing. The cost of getting a mortgage today, which is roughly just over 2% for an insured or uninsured mortgage on a five-year fixed, is about the same as it was last month and the month before. Let's tie all this back to the data I just gave you at the beginning. All-time high record levels of cash in the banks. Now, in the financial crisis of 2008, there was a piling on of cash as the equity market was being crushed and investors were taking money out of equities and putting it on the sidelines, as they said. This is not the same situation. The equity markets are up, which means investors haven't really jumped out of the market like they did in 2008. What's happened here is a combination of fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, that is absolutely flooding the market with an insane amount of cash. The question you need to ask yourself is, what's going to happen in the future? And I, the answer is, I don't know myself, but something probably very negative is going to come from this effect. As I said to my team the other day, look, we've gone through a global pandemic. The government has tried, and the central bank has tried to do their best to ease the pain of this pandemic. But I don't think we've felt the pain. I think we've just numbed the pain. This fiscal and monetary stimulus has been like coding on the body. It's just numbed the pain. And the reality is something's gonna come down the pipeline here. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't make sense for banks to have record high cash levels, they're barely lending any money out there, and interest rates aren't going down any further on, the, on mortgages. They are on cash deposit rates, but not on mortgages, which means people aren't getting mortgages, they're not seeing the rates drop, commercial lending activity is barely moved, and it makes sense because if you're a bank, you gotta be very careful in a market like this as to who you're gonna to lend to. I think the telltale sign is what's happening in the, in the bond market. We are continuing to see interest rates drifting downwards. This is me a sign far more than what the equity markets are showing, that the economy is in for a rough ride in the future. So as I said many times in my previous messages, if you're an individual investor, you better have a plan for your investment portfolio. If you don't have a plan, get a plan. Make sure you know what you own and make sure you're ready for this ride. And for institutional investors, we were pounding the table only a couple of months ago on allocating 10 to 20% of their portfolio in treasury bills. We're sticking to that program. We're telling our clients to diversify their portfolio, maintain liquidity, maintain low risk investment strategies because we don't know what the future is gonna hold. And as far as those who are searching out yield right now, I can tell you one thing's happening with that data 
the banks are not going to be increasing interest rates anytime soon. Not until that money gets lent out into the market or gets spent through the consumers. I think the big shift is going to happen when the monetary stimulus ends. When the monetary stimulus ends, when people stop getting their $2,000 monthly checks, when the number of uh, $40,000 interest-free loans runs out, that's when we're going to start to see things really have some traction. That's when the rubber is going to hit the pavement and that's when we're going to see the pain hit. I don't mean to leave this with a negative tone. It's a cautionary tone. And please make sure you've got a good plan in place. If, of course, you want to talk to our team, we'd be happy to speak to you, whether you're a high net worth investor or you're somebody in the world of cash management. Those are the two areas we specialize in. We'd love to speak to you. I'll have a new update for you soon. Thank you.